Hey guys, uh, doing something a little bit different today. Um, so GameMaker kind of brands itself as this easy to use, fast game dev solution. Um, but if you're coming in with little or no experience, it's probably gonna be pretty overwhelming no matter what software you use. So I've sat down and done my best to distill over a decade of GameMaker use into what I think are the bare essentials to get started. Uh, so I'm not really gonna be giving you a bunch of code to copy. I want to help walk you through more so my thought process so you can hopefully get started writing your own code. So hopefully after this, you can just start playing around and having fun with your own little projects because really no matter what I teach you, uh, I can guarantee that the best teacher for game dev is just to start making games. So we're just going to create a new project here. Uh, we're going to go with game maker language. D&D sounds good in theory, but it's not really a magic shortcut. Either way, you're still going to need to think like a programmer to get very far, so you might as well do it without any limitations. So over here, you'll see we have all these folders. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff, and a lot of stuff has been added over the years, um, but really, the ones that you need to focus on to get started uh, are going to be sprites over here. Uh, objects and rooms and you can see we actually already have a room because you need at least one room to even run your game so let's start by creating a sprite uh, sprites are basically going to be your visuals for the game so any kind of like character animations or backgrounds uh, you're going to want to create a sprite and so let's give it a name uh, typical naming convention you'd either start with spr underscore or s and then just the name of the thing you're creating uh, let's do player um, this is a little bit big. I'm just going to start with some 16 by 16. And then we click Edit Image. And you can actually doodle right in here. It's a bunch of tools for you to create your sprite. If you want an animation, you can just click this plus button here. Or you can actually copy your frames and paste them. And then make slight changes to them. Like, I don't know, maybe we want to make this guy's eye close or something. I don't really know. And then it could open back up again. Now, if you want to be as good of a spriter as me, uh, that's going to be a separate lesson. And it'll just kind of play through at your FPS here, 30 frames per second. And you can change this, and it will go slower or faster. I'm going to get rid of this, though, because it's going to be pretty distracting having him constantly winking at you getting you a little bit flustered. Now this thing over here is the origin. Sooner or later, you're gonna want to flip your sprite. Maybe you have a left and right animation. You can just reuse one animation and just flip them across the origin. And so if you have it here in the top left corner, when he flips, he'll flip all the way over here across his origin and it'll be a little bit jumpy. So if you're planning to do that, you'll probably want it in the center, maybe the bottom center, depending on how you're planning to transform the sprite. Uh, there's a bunch of presets in here, so let's just do middle center for now. So for this next part, I rounded off his edges a little bit, just because it makes the masks a little bit easier to understand, I think. Um, so if you want to tell if your character, say, is colliding with something else, touching something else, uh, what will be used is called a mask, a collision mask. And so it doesn't really matter what the sprite looks like here. The mask it's what is what's used to tell if he's touching something. So you can see he's a circle, but there's kind of this like transparent rectangle covering the entire image. So even these corners uh, will be considered part of the player. And so we could actually change this if we wanted to to precise. And now it's only covering him, and it's a little bit. It's not a simple square anymore, a rectangle. Uh, it's a more of a complicated shape, which means when you go to do collision checking, it will take a little bit more processing power which is why it says slow in here. Uh, usually rectangle will be fine. For the most part, that's what you're gonna wanna use. I don't think I've ever used diamond. I'm not really sure. You know, maybe if you're making like an isometric game or something, um, but really you're gonna wanna go with rectangles just because that's gonna be the least expensive and usually the best option. Now let's say we wanted a rectangle, but we didn't want those corners to be included in our collision checking. Uh, we could just go ahead over here and go to manual and then we can actually drag the mask to be whatever we want. Uh, so if we want to give players a little bit of leeway, maybe we're making like a bullet hell or something, and we don't want, we want the game to feel a little bit forgiving, we can shrink his mask a little bit. So our visuals are important, uh, but 
in order for our game to do anything, we need to create an object. So let's create a simple player object. We'll use O player. And then here we can assign him a sprite. So we'll use the sprite we've just created. You can think of an object as a collection of attributes, like maybe health or attack power and behaviors. So if you were making a Mario game, shh, you might have a Mario object and maybe a Goomba object. And these objects will define exactly how Mario or the Goombas will behave. So you might say that Mario moves and jumps when you press certain buttons and Goombas walk in one direction and they reverse if they bump into a wall. And if they touch Mario, he gets hurt. I'm going to jump over to rooms real quick because there's not much to say about them, but I'm going to reference them a little bit going forward. So we just open our room one here. Uh, these are basically, you could think of them as like levels in your game. Uh, you could also have a separate room for like a main menu or a pause menu. And here you can just place the sprites and objects we've been creating. Uh, so we're going to want a player object. And so we're going to put them, there's different layers. Uh, instances will basically be where you put your objects. So we'll hold down alt and we can put as many as we want. It's a player, so we really only want to put one. We could just create another simple example. Uh, maybe we just want to put some grass or something so you can draw a little bit of grass here. Beautiful, great. So now we can come back to our background layer and we can add our grass sprite here. Uh, and by default, it'll just place the one and we can have it tile or we can stretch it. Uh, neither of these are really gonna look very good uh, to start off and I don't really wanna make your eyes bleed. So we are not gonna have a background. What we can do instead is we can add an asset layer and that will let us just place our sprites wherever we want in the room. And so now if we run our game, you can press F5 or click this play button. Then we just have a very simple, very basic room. Can't do anything, but we do technically have a game. So rooms are just places where you can put your sprites and your objects in order to create a game. So pivoting back to our objects, we have our player object that does nothing yet. And we're also going to create an enemy object that will also do nothing for now. Uh, and so let's just give him a sprite real quick as well. So he is going to be red and very angry. And so in order for our enemy to actually do anything, we're gonna to need to add some events. Events let us run bits of code or logic whenever certain things happen to the enemy object. There are all kinds of events you can add, like literally a whole list of them. Uh, but all you really need to get started would be the create event and the step event. So create event here, we click it, and then we've got some code to write. The create event will happen, you guessed it, when an instance of that object is created. So we boot up our game, we enter the first room. As soon as these enemies and this player is spawned into the room, their create events will run, assuming they have one. So this is a good place to set up the data that your object will have. Let's say, since we're coding an enemy here, maybe we want him to have a horizontal speed, maybe we want him to move like a Goomba. So to define a variable, we just give the name of the variable followed by the equal sign and then the value. Typically I put a semicolon at the end. It's not required here, but it's a good habit to get into for other programming languages. It just means it's the end of a line. So here, all we've done is give HSP, which is a common shorthand for H speed that a lot of people use equals five. It doesn't do anything. It's just saying all Goombas will have this property. So next we'll look at the step event. And there's also a begin and end step event, but we can ignore those for now, just focus on step. So for this to make sense, you need to kind of understand the concept of game steps. You might think of games as this continuous thing that's happening, just like real life, but it's actually more like one of those flipbook animations where each page is a single frame. But if you play them really fast, it looks like a movie. So you can think of a game step as a single frame, and your game by default will run at 30 frames per second. This means that your game will go through 30 steps per second. So instead of running once, like the code in your create event, the code in the step event will be running 30 times a second for a 30 FPS game. If your game is 60 frames per second, it'll be 60 times a second. Now this just means your game will try to run the step event 30 or 60 times per second. If you're doing too much work, then the computer might fall behind and then your frame rate will drop. 
but you probably don't have to worry about that yet. Most behaviors will go into the step event. So for our enemy, we want him to move left and right. This is where we're going to do that. So since we're dealing with movement, we'll change the X and Y properties. These are just variables that are built into every object in Game Maker. And if you change them, you'll actually change your position in the room. So we could literally do X equals 100 and your object will just jump to that position. That's not really that interesting. Say we do X equals X plus five. Now we'll jump forward to the right five pixels every single step, which is 30 times a second. So your object will appear to drift to the right. So let's actually put an enemy in the room and just see what that looks like. Yep, and so he moves right off the screen. That's literally all he does, but it's something. So there's actually a shorthand for this. Instead of doing x equals x plus five, we can do x plus equals five. If we wanna move left, we can do x minus equals five, but we're not really doing anything that interesting because enemies are gonna move left and right all the time. And this really only lets us pick one. So instead we're going to use our variable, hspeed. It's important to declare your variables before you use them, otherwise your game will crash. You can call them whatever you want, you can call it horizontal speed, you just need to be consistent. So now that we're doing x plus equals hspeed, we can change our hspeed beforehand, and then he'll go either left or right depending on what we've set it to. So let's say we want to reverse after, I don't know, 3 seconds. So we'll do a counter, we'll create a timer variable, and we'll increase that by 1 for every step. So if our game is running at, say, 30 frames per second, 3 seconds times 30 frames per second would be 90 frames. So once our timer exceeds 90, we'll know it's time to reverse. And so we'll just multiply our H speed by negative 1. Now you might actually notice that there's a bug here, because by setting our timer to greater than or equals to 90, once we hit frame 90, we'll constantly be reversing, and we won't really go anywhere. So instead, we'll do equals equals, which is the equality check. So this will do one exact reverse on frame 90 or step 90. And so you can see here, he turns around once and that's all. So this isn't really super interesting, um, but before we move on, this is a little bit clumsy because 90 doesn't really mean much to someone who's just looking at the code. So we want to be a little bit more clear with our code. So we'll define a variable time to reverse. We can do three times 30 or three times 60, but we're going to do three times room speed so that if we decide to change our frame rate later on, then we don't have to go back in and change our variable. So we can swap out this 90 for time to reverse, and this makes a little bit more sense. Let's say now we want to reverse every three seconds. Now we can do this with the built-in alarm system in GameMaker. We use this alarm variable here, and in brackets we can do which alarm we want to use. Any object can have up to 12 alarms. They go from 0 to 11. Uh, and so here we're just saying that we want to use alarm zero. This works like the timer we already created, except instead of counting up, it's more of a countdown. So we set it here to our time to reverse, and on every game step, Game Maker will count down all of our alarms by one, and when it hits zero, it'll execute whatever code we have in that alarm event. So once our alarm hits zero, this code will run. And then if we want this to run multiple times, we can just set our alarm again right here in the alarm event. So the game will run until time to reverse, and then the alarm will go off, the code there will run, he'll reverse, and then we'll set the alarm again to time to reverse. So if we did this right, the enemy will reverse once, and he did, and then he should reverse again, and he did. So for our next step, instead of just having him reverse every couple seconds, we want him to reverse whenever he hits a wall. And so in order to do this, we're going to create a wall sprite and then a wall object. So I'm just going to do that real quick. Now this wall doesn't actually need to do anything, it just kind of needs to exist. We don't really want to use the solid property here. It's a built-in feature of Game Maker, but not a lot of tutorials use it. And it's better to just have control over these things yourself, so I would recommend not to use it. So let's open up our level and put a couple walls here for the enemy to bounce off of. And now in our step event, because this is happening every single step, we're going to want to check if the enemy is about to run into a wall. And so we'll use a built-in function called place meeting. And this takes three inputs. It takes an X and Y position and an object that you want to check for a collision with. In this case, our wall. And so this will basically look at a hypothetical situation and return true or false. If we move our object, this current object, to this X and Y position, 
will its collision mask overlap with the collision mask of one of these specified objects, in this case, a wall. And if it does, it returns true. If not, it returns false. So if we just do X and Y here, it'll literally check, am I inside of a wall? But that's kind of too late to be useful. We want to check before he runs into the wall. So that's why we're going to do X plus H speed. So we're going to do this before we actually increase our X by H speed. And we're just going to look, is the position that we're about to go into going to be colliding with a wall? And if so, we're just going to reverse our direction. So let's check that out. And there, you can see right before he touches the wall, he'll turn around. And he's basically a Koopa stuck between two pipes. So we still don't have a very interactive game. So at this point, we're going to focus on the player. So let's make a create event and let's give him an H speed of zero. We don't really want him to move unless the player explicitly tells him to. So first, we're just going to have X be incremented by whatever our H speed is. And instead of automatically setting our H speed, we're going to set it based on what the player is pressing. So we have a built-in function called keyboard check, and there's a couple variants. So if I hold down a key and I do keyboard check, it'll return true on every single step until I release the key. Pressed and released will only return true on the exact step that I press or release the key, and then from that point forward, it won't return true again until I've released the key and then pressed it again. In this case, we want the player to continue moving as we hold the key down, so we're going to do keyboard check. And so there are some built-in constants for different keyboard keys, VK right for right and VK left for left, so on. And here we'll just set our H speed equal to 5, but it's a little bit clumsy to do it this way. So we're going to define a variable called move speed, and then we're going to use that here. So that way, if we decide that 5 is too slow or too fast, we only need to change it in one place. So really, we're just going to do positive 5 for going right and negative 5 for going left. Now, we also want to move up and down. So we'll do V speed for vertical speed, and we'll just add up and down checks. Now, this is something that can be a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but going up is actually considered lowering your Y position in Game Maker. And I think game programming in general. So increasing your X will make you go to the right and decreasing it will make you go to the left. But increasing your Y will make you go down and decreasing your Y will make you go up. I found it to be a little counterintuitive when I started programming. So for down, we want a positive move speed and for up, we want a negative. And we'll just increase our Y by our V speed because if we don't do that, then there's no point in the V speed variable. So what do you think? You think this is gonna work? Trick question, things never work the first time when you're programming. So we uh, have this kind of funny diamond sort of pattern that we can move in. Uh, and the issue here is that we're never really setting our H speed or our V speed back to zero when we release keys. Even if we change one component of our direction, the other one is still kind of going. So we're always moving in this sort of diagonal direction. And so there are a couple flaws with how we've coded this. I'm just gonna completely scrap it. Um, and we're going to do something a little bit more elegant. So instead of all those if and else statements, we can actually do some Boolean math. So in GameMaker, a true is equivalent to a value of one and a false is equivalent to zero. So this actually lets us write a pretty interesting equation here. So we can do a keyboard check for right minus a check for left. And what this will do is if you think about it, if we're pressing right, then we're not pressing left. One minus zero is one, and that's a positive. That's moving right. If we're not pressing right and we're moving left, it'll be zero minus one, and that'll be negative one, which corresponds to moving left. If we're pressing both keys, like an absolute madman, it'll be one minus one, which will be zero, and we won't move. And if we're not pressing anything, it'll be zero minus zero, and we won't move. So this will give us our direction, and then we just need our speed, so we just multiply that outcome by our move speed, and that'll give us our H speed. And that one line will take care of moving right, moving left, and stopping. If you wanna write this a little bit more cleanly, we can break this up into two lines. It's never a bad idea when you're programming to add more variables and break up complicated looking code. So here I define an H direction variable, and I use the var keyword here to define what we call a local variable. This just means that H direction is only defined in this step 
So whereas the variables we made before were created in the create event and then used in the step event, we don't really need each direction to be used anywhere else. We just want it to be used here in the step event. So that's why I'm adding that var keyword. It's always a good idea to limit your variables to being used in the smallest number of places as possible. You'll help prevent more bugs that way and cause less confusion. So now our h speed is just our move speed times our h direction, which I think makes sense. And now we can basically just repeat that whole process, but for vertical speed. And so now if we run this, everything should work smoothly. Now our player controls exactly the way we want him to. He stops when we let go of the keys and we can move in diagonal and straight and all those fancy directions. In just two lines of code or four lines of code, not many lines of code, we've created a fully controllable character. Of course, he doesn't really do anything yet. The enemy doesn't do anything and he can walk through walls, but we're making progress. So for this last section, we're going to make a level that's just a little bit more interesting. We're going to bound the player into these walls and we're going to add a bunch of enemies to bounce off of the two walls. And we're just going to make it our goal to get the player from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen. So the first thing we'll do is prevent the player from walking through walls. Luckily, we've basically already implemented the collision check that we need in the enemy. So we can mostly just reuse that same logic, but with a slight tweak. See, because the player isn't moving automatically and he's moving based on our inputs, we don't want him to reverse. We just want him to stop. So we'll just set H speed to zero instead of reversing it. And because our player also moves vertically, we'll also want to do a V speed check as well. We'll add a little wall up here so we can't just go up and out and around. And so this collision check, you might be able to guess what I'm going to do. It's basically the same thing, but checking with vSpeed and adding it to our Y. I'm just looking at the position we're about to move to vertically and stopping if we're going to hit a wall. So here we go. We can't escape. These walls are trapping us. This is good. Our enemies don't really do anything though. So real quick, just going to add a collision check for the enemy. And if we hit them, we're just going to restart the game. Real simple. Now we also could actually use the built-in collision event here. This is totally fine. It's a really simple collision check uh, where the order of what we're doing doesn't really matter. Uh, I would avoid doing that same kind of collision event for our wall because it doesn't really give us the flexibility of checking different positions like our X plus H speed and our Y plus V speed, it only really lets us check our current position. And we also know in our code exactly where the collision check is happening. Whereas if we add the collision event, it's less clear where that's happening in our code and we have less control over it. So now we run the game and we have to try to get to the bottom. If we touch an enemy, we start back at the top. Really simple. Don't feel bad if your art doesn't look as good as mine. So while this might seem like a pretty simple game that we've created, we've actually covered a decent amount. We've done objects, sprites, and rooms, talked about a couple different kinds of events. We've done movement, keyboard input, collision checking, we've even done alarms. I will say that the collision checking that we have done is pretty rudimentary. And if you wanna do more precise collision handling, there's a couple different ways to do it. You'll probably need a loop. You might notice if you play around that the player doesn't actually stop right up against the wall. There'll probably be a little bit of a gap between him. And this makes sense if you think about it, because if your H speed is say five and you're working with a grid that's say 16 by 16, five doesn't really divide evenly into 16. So he's always going to stop when there's just a little bit of extra space there. It's a little bit outside the scope of what I want to cover today. It's definitely something I can cover in another tutorial though. But I think this is enough so that you can probably get started at least messing around with Game Maker. What you do next depends on what kind of game you want to make. For most types of games that you probably want to create, there's probably going to be a specific tutorial somewhere on YouTube if you want to make like a Mario game or more of an RPG like game. And if you really like this, then maybe I'll make some of my own. I'll leave some links in the description for tutorials and YouTubers that I think are pretty helpful. Some closing advice I'd like to give is that you don't really need to spend too much time watching tutorials. They're very good for learning something specific if you have a goal in mind, but if you're just learning for the sake of learning, you're probably just going to forget everything you watch. You'll probably have better luck just getting started and learning as you need to. I think for game dev, hands-on is really going to be your best bet. 
So let me know if this was helpful, and if you'd like to see more of these kinds of videos. This was something a little bit different for me, and first time making a tutorial like this. Usually I'm just making videos about either games that I like, or the game that I'm working on. Speaking of which, I'm developing my own action platforming roguelite in Game Maker, and I'm documenting the whole process from start to hopefully getting it released on Steam, and maybe even the Switch, if the Switch is still around by the time I finish it. I do devlogs roughly every month, so feel free to check that out as well. So hopefully you learned something today, and I'll see you next time.